Um, I really got interested in clean water because of Sandfields, because I felt that most of our industrial past can tell a story. It just needs somebody to tell the story. And one of the things I unearthed was this character, Jon Snow, and how he made this link between cholera and clean water. And most of us have seen what we call the ghost map, where Snow mapped out all the cases and made this link. And like most things history, um, when you delve into them, they start to propagate and you end up opening a can of worms. And so this story about Jon Snow, <laughs> it wasn't sort of like the Titanic, which sank and sank. Um, it, Titanic and Jon Snow have actually got very detailed backstories that we have to sometimes dig into. And those stories are vast and they're complex. And what I hope to do as an historian is to basically invite you all to sort of be a part of that discussion. Because I think, uh, you know, that if we're going to gain an understanding of our industrial past, then both us as professional historians, those as professional scientists, engineers, and the everyday people have got to be entitled to be a part of that discussion and to gain an understanding of those events. And then we can really then give things value. So um, the way I'm going to do this tonight is I'm just going to sort of do a very brief introduction as Jon Snow as a youngster. We'll talk a little bit about cholera, and I'm not going to get technical about it because I'm not a medic. Um, we'll also talk about the prevailing other theory, miasma, the miasma theories. And then I'll talk about Jon Snow's involvement in cholera. Jon Snow's grand experiment, um, the Broad Street Pump, which I'm sure a few of us know and probably love already, and actually the legacy of Jon Snow, because um, a lot of his ideas were originally poo-pooed, but he actually set some groundbreaking rules, which we now live our lives today. Um, at the end, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions, of course, you know, so um, well, let's see how we go. So, Jon Snow, born on 15th of March, 1813, in York. Um, he was the first of nine children, and his father was a labourer. He actually worked in a coal yard. Um, so we come from very humble beginnings. At a very young age, he demonstrated an aptitude in mathematics. He was very much like the engineer John McLean. Um, his father used to take him to the fair, and he would stand there, and he could sort of calculate the square root of 397,400, you know, in his head. But Snow was a very similar character, and I suspect might be a difficult child. <laughs> you know. um, he obtained, at 14, he obtained a medical, medical apprenticeship with William Hardcastle in Newcastle upon Tyne. His mother actually won a small dowry, and it looks like she spent it all on the, you know, the oldest son, John. During his, during his time as a surgeon apocryphy apprentice, he encountered cholera for the first time in 1831 because cholera actually got to Britain in the port of Sunderland in 1831. Um, by 18, he was treating coal workers with cholera in Killingworth, which is a small coal mine village not far from Sunderland. And he tried the usual stuff, bleeding, giving people coloured water, opium, herbs. It didn't really work. And those were the sort of standard remedies, as long with whitewashing the walls and don't drink alcohol. However, what Snow did do is he did try to rehydrate people with clean water. And that actually worked, but then people became ill again. And what Snow inadvertently did is he set the ground for the treatment of cholera. He was, it, it appears to be that he'd got a good understanding right back in 1931 of not only its cause, uh, but also its cure. And, and perhaps if somebody can remind me at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about water, you know, and cholera treatments. Um, <clears throat> he kept meticulous journals and notes from the mines. And what, one of the things Snow noted was that these cholera infections were far away from heavily populated places. And so we sort of wondered, how could these people be affected by miasma? Um, what he also noticed was the conditions the miners were working in. They'd go down underground and work a 12 to 14 hour shift. They wouldn't come to the surface, so they would defecate underground. 
And also they'd take their lunch underground and they would share their lunch, you know. And, and so, you know, and so Snow sort of starts to convince himself that this is more than air that's contaminating people. And he started to believe that cholera was actually spread by personal touch and communication. Anyway, in 1836, um, Snow ended up moving to London to commence his formal training in medicine. Um, okay, let's look at our cholera. So first of all, cholera, it's an infection of the small intestine, which is what we know today, by the bacterium Vibro cholera. Um, it was known as the Blue Death. Um, the symptoms can actually range, like most you know, diseases, from non to mild to very severe. And what I mean by severe is people die. Um, the symptoms can start within two hours to five days after being exposed to cholera. It's, it's quite an unusual bacteria because it has got this knack of multiplying rapidly once you get it. It literally, within the space of a couple of hours, you have set, you know, from, from ingesting just a few cholera bacteria, you suddenly, within a few hours, have got several million. Whereas diseases like syphilis do the opposite. They stay very low key. That's why they can survive in your body for so long. But with cholera, it just triggers an immune response immediately. And you, it, it, it's, it's vast. And of course, you know. Um, and illustrations at the time of people with cholera were that people would exhibit symptoms, severe symptoms, um, described as a rapid expulsion of the bowels. And they quite often would become ill and die within four hours. And in fact, one of the first cases in Bilston in 1832, um, there was a chap, his wife became ill, and he went to fetch the mother-in-law. By the time he got back, she was dead. And that, that was the terrifying thing about cholera. Um, the victims would pass between three gallons of diarrhea a day. And that, it, was like, it was called a filth disease because literally people just died in, in squalor. It was really sort of nasty. And it didn't mind if it infected, you know, like most diseases don't. Um, now, while the origins of cholera are probably unknown, it's certainly been around for quite a few centuries. And in fact, if you look at records, the Greeks look like they describe symptoms of cholera. So it's, it's been around, you know, several hundred, you know, several thousand years possibly. However, it really was an endemic disease. It, it's only a sort of affected, you know, small amounts of the population in far off places. But then in the 19th century, um, it became quite prominent. Uh, with a leaf outbreak in India. And that is probably associated with our globalization. You know, that once the industrial revolution kicked off and people started to travel, they started to trade, there were a few odd wars here and there, then cholera started to move with the population. And that's quite common in, pan in pandemics, isn't it? You know, we've, we've got to know and love that. Yeah. Um, the first royal cholera epidemic, you know, uh, that sort of became prominent in about 1817, and it seemed to uh, uh, start off, you know, in, in the Ganges Delta uh, with an outbreak in Jessore in India in 1817. And by 1820, it has spread to Thailand, Indonesia, killing 100,000 people on the island of Java alone. And the pandemic actually lasted about six years. And some th uh, th people theorised that what stopped it was actually the severe winter of 1823 to 1824, when, with today's knowledge, you know, um, they may think because the water surprise froze, that's probably what stopped it. So what would have probably happened is people were probably having to boil water, you see, because it was such a severe winter. <coughs> um, and again, it's, it's nice to have that sort of hindsight, isn't it? Um, but then the second uh, ep epidemic get, began in 1929, and by the autumn of 1820, um, 1830, sorry, um, it had made its way to Moscow, it's all the way through Europe, and by 1831, it spread to Sunderland in England, um, and it came in board ships. And that's, and that's where John Snow first witnessed cholera while he was a young apprentice doctor. Um, we did, you know, we enacted several actions to curb the spread of the disease, including quarantine and establishing local boards of health. And again, as we, you know, we've done today, we quite often know these things along the way, but there ain't a fat lot it could do. It continued to spread through Britain. It entered London 
and in 1932 it had reached the industrialised Midlands and I've spoken about that before, you know, so we all know and love what happened in, in the Midlands. There was in a third pandemic, um, which is probably worse than this third, second one, um, and that lasted from about 1846 to 1860 and about 23,000 people in Britain died. It was, it was quite a bad year for cholera that was. I mean, it just happened to be in the 1832 epidemic that really clobbered the Midlands, you know, that, that, you know there was about 10,000 deaths, you know, purely because of the industrialisation. Um, here's a list of cholera epidemics, which I won't read out. Um, there's one thing interesting about cholera is in the, this previous pandemic we've had, Yeah, yeah. Um, what's, what's happened with cholera? You know, we've heard about the exponential curve of, of, um, of um, COVID. Cholera doesn't follow that pattern. What cholera does, it keeps repeating and it just keeps doing. And in fact, the argument is we're now still going abroad through another cholera epidemic. In fact, it's probably the sixth biggest killer in the, on the planet. So even now, cholera is. Um, you know, it certainly kills more people than, you know, some, some cancers actually. So it, it's, it's a very enduring disease. You get about two cases a year in Britain. Those are people who've usually come abroad and, um, you know, but that can be treated fortunately. Okay, now, understanding of cholera, miasma. Um, again, the word's been around a lot longer than we imagine. In fact, the Greeks coined the word miasma. Um, they've got a Greek, Greek word for it, which I can't pronounce, so I didn't put it up. <laughs> but it basically means to pollute. <laughs> and the theory held that epidemics were caused by miasma, which is um, a bad air emitting from rotting organic matter. And it was, you know, considered to be a poisonous vapour. And if you think about it, I mean, I think it's easy to look back and to sort of sort to poo, poo the science of the past. But at the end of the day, the theory did fit the observations. And if you think about it, you know, things like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they are poisonous gases. You know, methane can cause asphyxiation. You can't smell it, but it can certainly be asphyxiated by it. And hydrogen sulfide certainly smells. I mean, I, um, my mother loved me for making hydrogen sulfide in the chemistry set one day. <laughs> and again, you get the, the dosage right of that and it can be pretty lethal, you know. So, so the sort of theory is right, but it was wrong. Um, it was consistent with the observations and it was also associated with poor sanitation. Some academics in the 19th century also suggested that the theory could, of miasma could be extended to other conditions. So in other words, you could become a beast by inhaling food vapours. I'm not sort of quite sure of that, but you know, the, you know, I mean, scientists, science, you know, like engineering is an exploratory subject. You have to ask those questions. Um, but the one thing what miasma did was, it was the basis of action for the sanitary reformers. So I don't think miasma was all that bad because what came out of miasma was Joseph Bazalgette and his London sewer schemes. And that's really good because as we know, later in the year, we're gonna be talking about Bazalgette, aren't we? So this actually underpins the two sides of the sort of arguments, yeah? All right, let's get back onto miasma. Now, with things we don't really understand, you know, you tend to get this bad press reporting, you know, and people were talking about there were more victims died in hospital than actually really died, and the, the victims, some of the victims were being killed by doctors because they wanted bodies for dissection. The whole thing, because it was not understood, it just created mass panic. You know, and people were terrified. And, and I mean, you can imagine diseases like cholera, you know, it's a really sort of nasty disease. You died in agony and it was a filthy disease. You died in your own squalor. People were frightened of the bodies. You could just see that it was rife, can't you, for sort of, you know, misappropriation of the press as well. Rumour control, you know. Um, but like I say, as you know, the scientists were trying the best. I won't poop poo them because you know, a lot of it were well thought through. And, and there's a guy called um, William Farr, who was um, a doctor, 
However, he was a miasma de devotee. He did a lot of research and tried to sort of establish proof that there was a miasma mast, you know, a mist of miasma which, which built up in intensity and slowly infected people with cholera and other sorts of nasty diseases, you know. So there were some good thinkers involved. What you've got to remember is we had not got a method of observing the cholera germ. And it's a little bit like, I mean, do you remember in the 1960s when we suddenly got these pulses of, and you know, and it was announced on the TV, we think we found the first signs of alien life because there was those regular pulses. And, and what it turned out to be is that once they developed the X-ray telescope, they realized these are quasars, they're spinning objects, and you know, and they're sending out radiation. And we couldn't, we didn't know until we'd actually got the X-ray telescope to see, to pick up the radiation, you see. So again, you know, it's about, what the observable world is. Um, okay, let's, let's come back to John Snow now we've done miasma to death. Um, he arrived in London in 1936 to start his formal medical training. Apparently, he walked it from Sunderland to London, you know, which is about 220 miles. <laughs> he was a bit of an obsessive individual, to be honest, he was. Um, you know, um, and in one year, he managed to complete his license to become a GP and a practical license, a bachelor's and doctorate, and a medicine and qualified to join the Royal College of Surgeons. <laughs> um, in 1850, he became the founding member, founded, one of the founding members of the Epidemiological Society, which is the study of diseases through demographic, demographic and mathematical data. Yeah, and we'll have a look at that in a bit. Um, he set up a practice at 54 Free Street in Soho as a surgeon general practitioner. And I've had a wonder down to look for his house lot, but it's a, bit, a very posh jeweler shop now. He was especially interested in patients with respiratory diseases. And I think that aroused his curiosity when he was treating people with cholera in the mines. You know, that the fact is that had this been miasma, he would expect it to affect the lungs, but it was actually affecting the bowels, you see. Um, so you could say, and he didn't let, want to let go. So Snow lived in Free Street, which actually, by coincidence, was right round the corner from the Soho epidemic. It was one of the first physicians to study and calculate dosages for chloroform and other surgical anaesthetics. And, and, and what I mean by that is it, anaesthesia, again, it'd be around a long time. You know, the Chinese would anaesthetize you with things like um, heroin, not, not heroin, sorry, um, opium. Yeah. And sometimes they'd hit you on the head with a mallet. <laughs> the problem with anesthesia was that they either hoped that when they anesthetized you, you woke up after the operation, or <laughs> you didn't wake up part way through. So Snow did, he, he was a real sort of, um, what can I put it on? I mean, he was a person who looked for patterns. And he did calculations on body weight, sex, sexuality, God knows what. And he managed to sort of work out dosages and he became so competent at it that he was able to anesthetize Queen Victoria when she gave birth to the uh, her last two children. She was obviously not amused at being pregnant, so <laughs> so so, um, so he anesthetized Queen Victoria. And what that did is that gave him a lot of prestige. And although it gave him a lot of prestige, he, he still never let go of this thirst to try to understand cholera. Now, what Snow says he needed was a grand experiment, right? So he needed this grand experiment. And what, what he sort of needed, he, he thought, was he needs a known source of cholera and to watch how it infects a population. And I'm not suggesting for one moment that Snow did that because there would be an argument, how would he know? You know, how would he know what, what would be infected? But um, certain conditions presented themselves automatically to snow. So in 1848, we got this third world epidemic and it returned to London. Snow managed to track down the first case, which is what you call case zero. And it, it was a sailor named John Arnold. Now Snow already knew that cholera seemed to come from sailors. And he'd established this in Sunderland and you can see in his notes, you know, they, wherever you get a sailor, you get bloody cholera. Um, and so spoke to, the, spoke to the physician who treated Arnold to find out that he had also treated another person 
who had died eight days before and was living in the same boarding house and slept in the same bed and they found out that they hadn't changed the sheets. Now bear in mind, you see, you know, when, when somebody's ill with cholera, what they pass out is water. It's, it's called rice water, so, you know, so it's like it, it, you pass a clear liquid, you know, it's not like our normal sort of bad curry night. Um, you know, but somehow somebody didn't change the sheets and it appears to be that somebody else got infected. Um, in 1849, Snow produced a paper suggesting that there was um, a contagion that was spread from person to person by water. Uh, the publication was called On the Mode of Communication of Cholera. Now, now Snow was quite, being quite careful here because um, he didn't want to tread on the toes of the people with miasma. And so he tried to suggest that it was like a, a water-based miasma initially. Um, you know, because you imagine this young Turk coming along and turning over years and years of your well-established research on miasma, people wouldn't stand for that. Um, but he, he sought proof, but the scientific community was still quite reluctant, even however he presented. Um, so like I say, he needed this grand experiment. And what he noticed was, there was a particular street in London where there'd been an epidemic. and um, what Snow noticed was that where the water flowed down the street, have I got a, yeah, there we go. As the water flowed down the street towards the well, and then on this side of the street, it was flowing away from the well. On this side of the street, um, that is where everybody was becoming ill. So the side of the, you know, side number one, um, people were sort of probably picking up their water that was being contaminated by the sewage flowing down the street. Yeah. Um, again, though, um, he thought he got proof, but there's still the scientific community because they say, no, we can explain that away with miasma, it's, it's just coincidence. Um, so he still needed more of a sort of direct link. So he continued to ex do his experiments. And what he started to do, he started talking to a chap called William Farr, who was a, a statistician, and he kept the records. Now, Farr himself was a miasma devotee. However, he was quite happy to work in a collaborative way with Snow, and he shared all the data with Snow. So what Snow found out was that a district where he lived had its water supply from two separate waterworks companies, the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company and the Lambeth Water Company. Both water companies drew their water from the River Thames. But Snow found out that the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company was downstream of the sewers, where the Lambeth Water Company was actually upstream of the sewers. And Snow thought, great, we can do an A-B test there to see who's getting cholera. Now, so... Yeah, okay, yeah. So Snow wanted to do an A-B test, and interestingly, again, it's the first time in medical history that an A-B test was documented. So it seems to be Snow kind the A-B test. So he saw this opportunity to do a comparison and look at the infection rate between the users from the respective water companies to see if there was any data. So he wrote to all the local people, he canvassed door to door, he started knocking on doors. But unfortunately, most people living in the area were just tenants and they had no idea who was supplying their water. So Snow went back, he went back to William Farr, they dug out all the records of, of, of the landlords. But the problem was, um, you gotta remember that we were in the golden age, you know, a lot of people making money, a lot of people investing. So most of the properties were owned by individuals who had no idea, they were just investing the money. They had no idea what properties they owned. They were operating through brokers, you know, or fund managers. And fund managers were buying up properties for them. These were being sent out to letting agents. And it was just a monumental task to try and work out, purely by looking at the physical records of who owned the properties and which water companies supplying which. The other thing is, of course, is um, people were sort of plugging into their opponents' water supplies or the water company's supplies. You know, so there was a bit of sort of school doggery going on, uh, around there as well. So we looked for a way to test the water. And what it found was because the Southwark Waterworks was further downstream and the Thames was tidal, there was a differential salient gradient. 
And at the time, Snow was able to test for the salt levels. So we could look and found out that the Southwark water was about four times more saline than the Lambeth Water Company. So we went back around all the houses and took a water sample. And from that, he found out that 38 of 44 deaths in a month had come from the Southwark Waterworks Company. Of course, they were not too pleased, um, you know. Um, you know, I mean, as far as I was concerned, it was, it was a link, you know, but the, the Southwark Water Company weren't happy. And still the community, you know, the scientific community argued, oh, you know, it's just a bit of coincidence. And I think there was also something, you know, arguments about um, there cannot be nothing smaller living than what's observable. So, you, you know, there's no such thing as microscopic nasties like you can't see. You can either see it or, you, or it doesn't exist. Yeah. Okay, so um, the Broad Street Pump. Snow was continuing his grand experiment and generally looking at statistical data, working with William Farr and a few other people, when suddenly there was uh, an outbreak of cholera right around the corner from where they lived. And this was, this was, this was like a icing on the cake for his grand experiment. So within three days of the first case zero, 127 people had died. And by mid-September, 610 people had died. And because Snow lived uh, locally to the epidemic, he was rare there every single day. Um, as I say, Snow lived there in Fray Street, which was literally just a short walk from the, you know, from the centre of the epidemic. Now, um, we all know that map, don't we? You know, I mean, I, I think most of us know that map. There's a lot of misconception about it because a lot of people think that he, he did that map as the epidemic was in place. Um, pinpointed it then, but it didn't. That map was done after the epidemic had started to subside, right? Um, but as Snow was a scientist, he started to use some deductive reasoning behind it. And he basically got on his feet. He walked around, he spoke to people, and he looked for patterns, and he looked to try and predict the cause of the contagion, the centre of the disease. But he also started to work very closely with the Reverend Henry Whitehead, and he was like an interesting character in your it was. He was initially a, a miasma devotee, you know. And, um, but the one thing Henry Whitehead knew, he knew the local population. He was a very popular and he was an incredibly trusted individual of integrity. And so the local population had trusted him. The problem is, is most of the local population had scarpered, you know. That, they had literally got up and packed the bags and gone. However, Henry Whitehead um, knew where people had moved to. He could talk to people. Have I pressed the wrong button? Let's have a look. And when they started to plot the deaths, Snow did some analysis and he, he built a thing called a Vornali diagram. In other words, he, he calculated the main center of the disease and what was the distance from the houses, the shortest distance to the pump, which is the most lightly used pump. And what Snow, this, this analysis established was that this pump right in the centre of Broad Street was right at the mean mathematical centre of the disease. And nearly all the deaths had taken place within a very short distance of this one particular pump. Um, Snow did take samples of the pump, but couldn't find any, anything amiss. And the one thing that Henry White said come back with this is, well, people like the Broad Street Pump, you know, it's really pure, clean, fresh water. Whereas some of the other pumps in the location, they wouldn't touch it with the barge, of course. There's a couple of them, they stang, you know. Um, now, there were only um, 10 deaths from houses that were nearer to some of the other pumps. And because Whitehead knew the community, he went out to interview people, he trapped people down who moved away and established that five of these cases of the families of the deceased persons informed Whitehead that although there was a nearer pump, because the water was a bit smelly, they used the Broad Street pump instead. Yeah. And Whitehead also discovered that three of the cases, the disease was kids on the way to school. And they, they'd stop at the Broad Street pump and have a drink. And regarding the deaths that occurred locally, 
there were 61 insta- instances where White House was informed that the persons who died who weren't near the pump just occasionally got some Broad Street water. So, so you know, as far as snow was concerned, you thought, well, this is all sort of wrapped up and proven. And I think you've seen the cartoon and we probably know the story where he managed to convince the Board of Health that it was the pump. And there's, of course, the story of removing the handle from the pump. But again, um, the Board of Health did indulge snow by removing the handle. Um, however, they weren't convinced. And, if, you know, the, the ha- room and handle didn't really change nothing because the epidemic had started to run out anyway because everybody just moved away. And so the authorities put the handle back on. Uh, and they still insisted that it's coincidence, you know, people come along and say, oh, it's through miasma. So what Snow and Whitehead did then, they says, well, look, let's look for some exceptions. And, and I quite like those exceptions rules because it's the thing I used to do myself, you know. So what is an exception? So what they looked for was people who should have died of cholera in the relation, location of the pump who didn't. And then maybe was there anybody who died but should not have. And in fact, William Farr says, ah, gotcha. He says, I've got somebody who lives in Amstead and who's died of cholera. So, so, so your Broad Street argument falls apart. Anyway, Snow and White had worked together. What they found was that near the pump, there was a workhouse where there was something like over 400 inmates, but only four people had died. White had confirmed that the, the workhouse had actually got its own well, but though four people had died, had actually been out to the Broad Street pump and drank the water. And so very few of those occupants had died. And of course, we know about breweries, don't we? You know, that the fact is most of brewery workers drank beer. Um, and, and of course, um, if you boil water for four hours, you know, when you make beer, you normally boil the hops for about four hours, don't you see? So I think you boil something for four hours and... <laughs> There's not many things survive that, is there? So, so the brewery itself, you know, was stayed clear. So if you look, I mean, in relation to the pump, is the workhouse. But like I say, there were only four deaths in the workhouse. And then if we sort of whiz across to the brewery, again, no deaths at all. Well, a bunch of beer drinkers. I'm convinced. <laughs> I think we need to get in the pub. Um, now... William Farr says, ah, gotcha, you know, there's, there's somebody from Amstead who um, has died of cholera. It's a lady. She's a widow um, of a percussion cap maker. And so what had happened is she'd moved away to Amstead. She lived by the Broad Street pump. Her husband had a little factory that was making percussion caps. He died. When he died, she moved away. However, she liked the water from the Broad Street pump. So she used to send the servants to get her a bottle of water for every so often. And unfortunately, she died. So that really concluded, you know, the, the two exceptions. So what Snow had developed with the IB tests and, and, and this, you know, by exception. Now, um, there was in further research, people started to think about this. So the further research by an independent surveyor. Uh, and Snow established that he felt that case zero would have been at number 40 Broad Street. And indeed it was. It was a baby of the Lewis family. There were probably about 30 people living in the house, but there was a, this, this Lewis um, baby. When they sent the surveyors out, they did some excavations, and they found out that there was an actual cesspit in the road, literally about three foot away from the Broad Street well. And what had happened with this cesspit is it belonged to a house that had been knocked down as they widened the road and not really sort of filled in. And it was still sort of sewage from the house, brought 40 Broad Street, was finding its way in. And they excavated it and found it was cracked. And the water literally just, the sewage water was literally poured into, straight into the Broad Street well. And what had happened is the baby had contracted cholera from somewhere else. And as it was soiling its nappies, his mother was washing its nappies. The nappies um, in the sink was being emptied into the cesspit. The cesspit was finding its way into the Broad Street well. When the baby died, the epidemic took a bit of a dip. But because cholera has got this gestation period of a few hours to about five days, the father of the baby became ill, 
as he was soiling his clothes and his bed linen and his wife was washing it, it was then reinfecting and the cycle was starting again. So shortly after the removal of the pump angle, the, the, um, the epidemic did start to subside. In fact, it was subsiding before the removal. But Stowe's views were still rejected by the medical um, establishments. However, he had made sufficient impact. And in fact, it was, you know, 10 years later in 1966 that Robert Koch, the German scientist, and our very own Louis Pasteur eventually identified germs. Yeah. Um, you know, so, you know, 10, 10 years later, um, you know, Louis Pasteur from pasteurized milk. So, um, what legacy did John Snow leave? Well, first of all, I think something that's really important is what Snow did is work collaboratively. Um, I personally don't believe in eureka moments. I've worked in industry and I've worked in, commercial, in the commercial sector and I've never had a eureka moment, but I'll tell you what I have had. I've had great teams of individuals with individual skills that we've brought together to come up with really good solutions to complex problems. And that's what Snow did. He worked with others and even accepting of their differences of opinions, it didn't let that get in the way, you know. Um, if you look at people like Charles Darwin, Charles Darwin announced, you know, this Eureka moment where he suddenly discovered all by himself um, the science of evolution. Darwin was another avid note taker. And if you look at Darwin's notes, he actually was working with lots of other people over a period of 20 years. And it's just that he, he announced it first. But I, it certainly wasn't a Eureka moment. And I certainly I don't believe in Eureka moments because I think, you know, most of these groundbreaking ideas are actually when we're prepared to set aside our differences and work together. Yeah. So he worked collaboratively with others um, and he, prov he did provide this connection between clean water and cholera. And the thing is, you know, the work with the Reverend Whitehead and with Farr, it was able, enabled Snow to combine demographic study with scientific observation and with statistical analysis. And it set this preset for the science of epidemiology. And as we now know, you know, the prediction of diseases and pandemics has probably saved a lot of lives. Um, he, as an anaesthetist, he, he worked with ether. Um, I mean, you know, we, I was an ethicized with Ether when I was, was, when I was a kid, you know. And, um, and the thing is with Snow, he, he, he really developed the science of anesthetics, but he never patented nothing. What he basically did is he, what we now call open sourced everything. He was just a person who didn't want the fame, he didn't want the fortune. He just wanted to share the information, so he published papers on it. And for that, you know, I just think that the guy needs applauding, that the fact is he was a completely unselfish individual. Um, his work ultimately led to the growth of large industrialized cities because once cholera reared its head, that was going to be the end of urbanization. You know, that would have really stunted the industrial revolution. That would have stunted growth because the one thing about industry is it tends to work when you've got these sort of vast areas of, of industrialization. But cholera and, and, some, and some of the other diseases was, was going to scupper it. But what Snow did was it, it enabled the growth of large cities. And, and, and I think we can be thankful for that today. However, um, he did have quite poor health, John Snow did. And in the 10th of June, 1858, he suffered a stroke. And within a couple of days, he, he, he died. Now, his post-mortem examination showed he'd had TB and he'd also got advanced renal disease. Um, he was a bit of a health obsessive. I, I do know that he would only drink distilled water. And I think maybe that would have been, well, if you'd been working in killing of collieries and you sort of got a theory that this disease is, you know, that's that sense of Britain and is now in the environment, was caused by water. I think that was a pretty sensible thing to do. Um, he also adapted a vegetarian, then vegan diet, but he found his health worsened. So he sort of then reverted back. So he was, he was quite obsessive. And, you know, and of course, he walked it from Sunderland to, you know, to, to London. Uh, so I think he was, a, he, was a, he was an amazingly interesting individual. 
um, bit of its legacies is they've now put the Broad Street pump back in its original location there. They used to have a, a red curbstone, um, but they put the pump back. And they've named the pub John Snow. I don't think it was a pub at his time, but they certainly named the pub. I can't remember this. I've been there. I've just not been in there for a pint of meat. So. And I think here, this was 40 Broad Street. That was where Case Zero and Baby Lewis lived. And like I say, in that house alone, there was about 30 people living. Um, and every year, the John Snow Society, they come out and there's a character dressed like John Snow and it comes out into, you know, lots of chairs. He removes the pump handle and then somebody else who's a member of the Board of Health comes and puts the pump handle back on to lots of boos and hisses. And they do that every year. I think it's in September. I keep learning to go. And I think on that, I'm going to shut up and ask if anybody's got any questions. Thank you. <laughs>